The Tom Woods Show, episode 1911. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. I thought I would do an episode because I can't imagine I'm going to be able to get away with not doing an episode on the Dr. Fauci emails, this big dump of email correspondence with Dr. Fauci's name on it that resulted from a Freedom of Information Act request. And I want to go through a few points that we discover in them. Now, I I don't think there's a huge smoking gun here, but there are a few things, as you'll see, that point to at least some suspicious possibilities. Let's, Let's say that. It's highly unlikely that in his emails, he's going to just give the whole game away that bluntly. He, he would convey his, let's say, uh, opinions that he wouldn't want known in other ways, or over the telephone or whatever. So for instance, I have people saying, ah, look at this. He's admitting that masks don't work back in February of 2020. But he said that publicly also. He was very clear about this. And Trump was right to say that in the debates, although he wasn't very good when he's talking about Fauci, he wasn't very good at recalling exactly what Fauci said, but he was very decisive when it came to the pointlessness of wearing masks in this situation. So that's nothing new. There's nothing new about that. And the thing is with Fauci, we've had so much come out of his mouth that's turned out to be wrong. Like he's been wrong on schools. He's been wrong on Florida. He's been wrong on Texas. Uh, He's been wrong about, uh, well, I, I don't know if he's wrong. He's almost completely ignored the collateral effects of the lockdowns that he's recommended. He has a bad track record. And he also has a track record of talking out of both sides of his mouth, depending on which person he's talking to. So we actually have an awful lot of examples of him being all over the place. So we didn't need this email dump for that, to draw that particular conclusion. I do want to discuss them there because as I say, I think there's still enough in here that ought to make us wonder, particularly about the Wuhan lab leak theory as to the origins of the virus. There are some emails in here about which I, if I were a U.S. senator questioning Dr. Fauci, would have some, let's say, follow-up questions. Let me begin actually by reading to you a passage that was written by a member of my supporting listeners group inside the Tom Wood Show Elite, where you know you belong in your heart of hearts. And he writes this, St. Fauci is a longtime senior bureaucrat. He is a survivor with many legacy media connections. He plays up to the Bill Gates types. He is very careful in his comments and his emails. The smart survivors learn early to talk in code. This is an observation made by the sadly departed Robert Wenzel. In the old days, Teddy Roosevelt would write letters to J.P. Morgan asking what his policy should be, and specific policy recommendations came back. Now they speak in code. Wenzel would give the example of Buffett calling up the Treasury Secretary in 2008 and asking about AIG. The question was, would Treasury bail out AIG, making a Buffett loan to AIG a huge windfall for Buffett? When asked about the status of AIG, the Treasury Secretary said that AIG was critical to our financial infrastructure, but no promise of any bailout. But in the code, it was clear a deal was coming, and Buffett made the loan, and a huge windfall. I would be very surprised, this continuing with the supporter, to find any smoking guns in St. Fauci's emails. I have not read any smoking guns. The claims that St. Fauci committed perjury in testimony with Rand Paul seem very difficult to prosecute. St. Fauci will put out an elaborate word salad and claim his definition of gain of function is different from Rand's definition. Again, the key takeaway is that the Biden administration wants masks and lockdowns to go away and the economy to recover. It is critical to their political survival. St. Fauci has outlived his usefulness and will get retired. To expect anything more is wishful thinking. The emails show that St. Fauci in emails is like St. Fauci in public interviews. He talks out of both sides of his mouth constantly. He is not stupid, and he knows that lab release is a possible source of COVID-19. He will continue to insist that he is infallible and adjusts to new data as it emerges. History will judge him very harshly, but with the corrupt systems we have today, he will walk off to retirement. May God have mercy on his soul. 
he has much to answer for. Well, how about that? You want to hang around with the kind of person who writes a post like that? Then head over to supportinglisteners.com and join us. Now, let me dig into some stuff that I do think is worth looking into. And then I want to tell you about an article in Vanity Fair that you really need to read. And I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1911. We'll get to that in a minute. I want to start off with some stuff that Alex Berenson, who's been very good on most of this material all this time, all through 2020, dug out of the huge dump of emails. So, for example, one thing we find out is that the U.S. government had planned to have a genuinely independent group, the National Academy of Sciences, examine the origins of COVID-19. And how do we know about this? Well, Fauci told a CDC official in February 2020, but then this inquiry never occurred. So I would want an answer to that question. Why did this inquiry not occur? Berenson says, from the first, Fauci made sure he was at the very center of everything, both the public face and the private heart of the U.S. pandemic response. I assumed that was because he liked the limelight and wanted to be in charge. But the emails suggest he had another motive, too. Now, if you've been following Rand Paul's confrontations with Dr. Fauci, you'll be aware that in the most recent such confrontation, Dr. Paul accused Dr. Fauci of having overseen the funding obviously the partial funding of the Wuhan lab at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and in particular of having funded so-called gain-of-function research, whereby pathogens are made more infectious in the course of scientific research. This kind of research, by the way, is controversial. Mark Lipsich of Harvard, who has uh, debated was it Martin Kulldorff or Jay Bhattacharya, one of the signers of the Great Barrington Declaration, so who's not on our side of things, has been a vocal opponent of this kind of research, thinks it should be banned. Uh, Dr. Fauci has supported it. And it's clear that such research was indeed happening in that lab. Now, very early on, so February 19th, 2020, The Lancet, which is one of the most respected medical journals in the world, published a statement in which over two dozen scientists said that we refuse to entertain the possibility of this virus being in some way man-made, that this is a natural virus, it has a, it has a natural origin, and we strongly condemn conspiracy theories to the contrary. And they expressed solidarity with all scientists and health professionals in China. So in other words, they're trying to make it seem as if you'd have to be xenophobic to think that this might have escaped from a Chinese lab. But of course, what, why would that make you xenophobic? Maybe there was an accident, which is what a lot of people think now. Not necessarily that it was deliberate, but that it was an accident. We have uh, numerous testimonies to the poor safety and security protocols there. That initial letter to the Lancet really, really put a damper on people's efforts to look into the matter of the origin of the virus impartially. This really was meant to have a chilling effect on the freedom of expression and research. Well, it turns out that this Lancet statement was organized and signed by a fellow named Peter Dezak, who was a zoologist, who, according to Vanity Fair, has repackaged U.S. government grants and allocated them to facilities conducting gain-of-function research, Among them, the Wuhan Institute of Virology itself. We also learn in the Vanity Fair article that David Asher, who's now at the Hudson Institute, but who earlier ran the State Department's day-to-day COVID-19 origins inquiry, said that it soon became clear that, quote, there is a huge gain-of-function bureaucracy, unquote, inside the federal government. So we know that U.S. taxpayer dollars go to this lab. We know that for a time, U.S. taxpayer dollars were allowed to be used for gain-of-function research. Then for a few years, that was they put an end to that. Then it was brought back. that You could make exceptions to the rule, but first it had to be reviewed by a committee, but then some of it wasn't being reviewed by a committee. Well, why is that? Well, Fauci says because it wasn't gain-of-function research, but now it looks like it was. It's a fiasco. So what it looks like is happening in some of these early emails is that Dr. Fauci is scrambling to get a handle on this because it could very easily be turned around that 
some gain of function research was going on in that lab and there was a lab leak yielding us the virus and this could wind up leading right back to the U.S. and Dr. Fauci himself. The first interview that was done of Fauci since the emails came out was by MSNBC's Nicole Wallace and she simply said this, the true mark of someone is if they look good even when their personal emails come out. So you pass the test Very few of us would pass. And that was MSNBC's reference to the whole thing. Looking through that interview, Alex Berenson finds it interesting that in the middle of it, Fauci suddenly starts defending himself on the gain of function question, which was not even brought up by the reporter. This reporter probably didn't even know about that because they're not actually doing journalism. (laughs) So she didn't even ask him about that. And for some reason, he's defensively bringing that issue up. Now, that MSNBC thing I just said reminds me that I, I want to say something about my friend Tom Elliott. I got to know when he was the producer of the Peter Schiff show back when I used to host that, when it used to be on the terrestrial radio. And he now has a media service called Grabian. And he compiled some statistics. These statistics were compiled early on the morning of June 4th. And he said, so far, here's the coverage we've had. Fox News Channel, 116 mentions of the emails, three hours and 48 minutes of coverage. CNN, one mention of the emails, 28 seconds of coverage. MSNBC, one mention of the emails, five seconds of coverage. The Biden White House jumped to the defense of Fauci without addressing any of the particulars in the emails. So we got the White House press secretary saying, the president and the administration feel that Dr. Fauci has played an incredible role in getting the pandemic under control, being a voice to the public, throughout the course of the pandemic. And then I happen to note that Yahoo News added, Fauci has long been a lightning rod for criticism in the culture war around COVID because of his advocacy for mask wearing, among other measures to combat the virus. So notice that Yahoo simply assumes that mask wearing combats the virus. So thereby making it appear that critics of Dr. Fauci must just perversely favor the spread of the virus. But I especially like how in that formulation by Yahoo News, the devastation of millions of people's livelihoods, savings, and physical and mental health is subsumed under the anodyne phrase, other measures to combat the virus. January 31st, 2020, an immunologist, Christian Anderson, writes to Fauci saying that parts of SARS-CoV-2, quote, look engineered. Then there's a secret call between Anderson, Fauci himself, and some top virologists. Two months later, Anderson writes a paper claiming that the virus isn't manipulated, but Fauci helped him with the paper, which became the standard text used against anybody who questioned the natural origins of the virus. Well, then we have February 1st, an email from Fauci to his deputy, Dr. Hugh Auchincloss. Subject line, important. Attached to this email is a paper from Nature Medicine from 2015 describing gain-of-function research on coronaviruses. And that's research that the director of that Wuhan lab helped to conduct. And this is research that, as I indicated, other scientists said was too risky and had all kinds of moral problems. I gave um, Lipsitch as an example. And Fauci says, Hugh, it is essential that we speak this morning, or this AM, he says. Read this paper. You will have tasks today that must be done. And I don't think Berenson is overdoing this when he says tasks that must be done. That doesn't sound suspicious at all. What tasks? Well, maybe he's just sending him for coffee. What tasks that must be done? But we are definitely reading about a conference call held on very short notice with several of the world's top virologists for, quote, a discussion in total confidence, unquote, and then, quote, on a complex issue, unquote. Okay, maybe we want to know about this call. Hey, everybody, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Merck Investments. I sense a lot of frustration among some of our folks that in our circles, we hear a lot of talk that there is always an imminent stock market crash, and then we just keep hearing this over and over and over. And sometimes that's right, but it's not always right. And our friends at Merck Research are trying to provide unbiased monthly analysis on the economy and stock market. And through a consistent set of easy to read charts and frameworks with written analysis, you'll get through these monthly reports an intellectually consistent view on the market and economy that is not just doom and gloom. 
So you can download the PDF chart books with analysis or watch the video voiceover walkthrough. And their goal is just to help you better understand what's really going on and ultimately to help you make better investment decisions. So much financial media has become fear-mongering clickbait. And indeed, in the long run, maybe there is bad news, but that does not mean that in every short-run segment, it's always bad. So if you're tired of nonstop doom and gloom and you want an objective, insightful summary of what's going on in the market and economy, go over to tomwoods.com research for a no-risk three-month free trial. And it's only $20 a month after that. That's tomwoods.com slash research. Now, let me get a little bit more deeply into the Vanity Fair article, which does not really rely on the emails. Vanity Fair has been doing, apparently had been doing its own research for quite a while, not just on the origins of the virus, but on people who were trying to figure out the origins of the virus. And it's interesting that Vanity Fair admits that with Trump as president, it was hard to pursue the truth on this because Trump was a a racist and a xenophobe and you couldn't trust anything he said. And so if he thought that there might be a lab leak explanation, then that just made it toxic for everybody else. I'd like Vanity Fair to just, as good as the work that they've done on this is, I'd like them to admit that they wouldn't have done it last year. They would have just kept quiet about it. I mean, it's really unbelievably juvenile of them to make an argument like that. That, well, there was a bad guy, a guy we didn't like who had this particular opinion about what might have happened. So therefore, we couldn't even consider that possibility. Well, how scientific is that? But here's how they summarize what they found. A months-long Vanity Fair investigation, interviews with more than 40 people, and a review of hundreds of pages of U.S. government documents, including internal memos, meeting minutes, and email correspondence, found that conflicts of interest stemming in part from large government grants supporting controversial virology research hampered the U.S. investigation into COVID-19's origin at every step. In one State Department meeting, officials seeking to demand transparency from the Chinese government say they were explicitly told by colleagues not to explore the Wuhan Institute of Virology's gain-of-function research because it would bring unwelcome attention to U.S. government funding of it. Further, in an internal memo obtained by Vanity Fair, Thomas DeNano, former acting assistant secretary of the State Department's Bureau of Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance, wrote that staff from two bureaus, his own and the Bureau of International Security and Nonproliferation, warned leaders within his bureau, quote, not to pursue an investigation into the origin of COVID-19, end quote, because it would, quote, open a can of worms if it continued, unquote. And now, again, I don't know how to respond to this, but Vanity Fair writes, with President Trump out of office, it should be possible to reject his xenophobic agenda and still ask why, in all places in the world, did the outbreak begin in the city with a laboratory housing one of the world's most extensive collection of bat viruses doing some of the most aggressive research? Why do they have to keep putting Trump in there? What is the problem with just pursuing the truth no matter where it leads you? Okay, we get it. You're fashionable. You don't like Trump. We get it. I really, really want to urge people to read this article to see how independent thinkers really were shut down at every turn. And they were asking quite legitimate questions. In February 2020, a research paper published by two Chinese scientists asked this question, which is a legitimate question. How did a novel bat coronavirus get to a major metropolis of 11 million people in central China in the dead of winter when most bats were hibernating and turn a market where bats weren't sold into the epicenter of an outbreak? That's a simple question. That you don't even need much scientific training to realize is the kind of question that demands an answer. So what we know at this point is that there was gain-of-function research going on in the Wuhan lab, that Dr. Fauci approved of this kind of research, even though other experts did not that there was U.S. government funding for some of these types of research, that one of the people who most encouraged this type of research also happened to be the person who rammed through this Lancet letter saying it's racist and xenophobic to think that this might have come out of a Chinese lab. To say that there is something fishy about this would be probably the least we could say about it. Now, next week, I am not going to... I don't think I'm going to be covering this issue. I'm going to take a week where we do some of the things we used to do on the old Tom Woods show. We're going to do some U.S. history next week. 
And it's going to be Thomas Jefferson week next week, not because we're going to talk about Jefferson specifically every single day, but because I'm going to have the great and brilliant Brian McClanahan on for several episodes to talk about a brand new book he has, The Jeffersonian Tradition, where we're not just going to look at Jefferson as a person, but his ideas and their value and their relevance for today. And we'll also do this by bringing the great Marco Bassani back on the show and exploring some unknown American history in his book, Chaining Down Leviathan. So if you like and appreciate what goes on here at the Tom Woods Show, then become a supporter, become a supporting listener. You get a ton of bonuses. It's an embarrassment of riches when you look at all the goodies you get, not to mention you become a member of the Tom Woods Show Elite, which is the greatest group in the history of the world. So check that out at supportinglisteners.com. Listen to that little voice in your head saying, ah, Woods is putting out a pretty darn good podcast day after day after day. He's almost up to 2,000. Maybe we should become a supporting listener. That little voice, God bless that little voice in your head. Listen to that voice. Head to supportinglisteners.com and I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.